Excelente. Welcome, everyone, to episode number two of No Party Preference. My name is Josh, and I'm here today with uh, who I will probably be referring to as Inflammatory Adam. Inflammatory Adam. Uh, let's see how long that lasts. <laughs> probably not very. But <laughs> it's going to last this weekend. This, this and weekend, it'll that's be, it. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be gone. Uh, probably it'll probably be gone by the end of this episode. It'll last as long as we had the conch cell, which was for oh. one, one podcast. It did not go as well as I thought it would, but uh, in concept, it was kind of cool. Agreed. And, and you know what? We tried it and and hey, it just kind of was annoying and did, <laughs> it, there was too many pauses because having to hand the, sh- the shell to each other and then raise your hand and then all this other shit. Uh, I, if I was in that time with those kids uh, in the Lord of the Flies, I would have just killed everybody. If we had to, if I had to hold a conch to speak in general, murder. That's it. That's all that's happening. Anyways, uh, welcome to the second episode here. And before we get started, I just would like to say that uh, if you enjoyed that intro song, you can hear that and plenty more off of Millennial Frog's new three album drop, which is available now. Let's go. Wherever you can download music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or I'm sorry, Apple Music, all, all the available. Platforms. All the platforms are available now for Millennial Frog's new albums, Poverty of Content, The Gentleman Known as Millennial Frog, and 30 Second Master. Straight gas. Straight gas. You heard it first. Straight gas, homie. If you know the reference, then holler at your boy on Instagram or Game Rage Magazine on Instagram. Or what are the other tags for all the other social medias? Uh, it's just at Game Rage Magazine, and then on Twitter, it's at Game Rage Mag. Y'all know what it is. Yeah, you guys know what it is. Uh, and if you like our, if you like hearing us talk about this bullshit, then you'll probably like us here to talk about a bunch of other bullshit. So you can go listen to all our other podcasts, All Gas, No Trash, Music, Anime Syndicate, Central Intelligence about global current events, geopolitics, Chirpin' from the Pine, the newest released podcast of Game Rage. Well, actually, this would technically be the newest released podcast by the time it's out, but... That's our sports podcast. We have movies and TV, Game Rage Wrestling about pro wrestling, panel to panel, which we're just restarting. Finally, oh yeah, we're, we're giving it the do that it needs. So if you like comics, go and check out some episodes because there'll be some definitely new ones up by the time this is out. Mm-hmm. And Team Killing Glitch Tars, the game gaming podcast, and the crown jewel of the Game Rage Magazine podcast network, without censor, the interview podcast. Several bangers of podcasts on there. Do yourself a favor and go check them out. Anywhere podcasts are held, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Well, I don't think that is anymore, but you you get the drill. You, yeah, Geo Cities. Um, <laughs> uh, you can use your your at Hotmail account. Yeah, or your AOL dot com. Uh, yeah. Maybe on GameFAX. Or- oh yeah. We we'll definitely have it on MySpace. Oh, for sure, hundred percent, hundred percent. MySpace is for musicians. All right, that's <laughs> Millennial Frog is a as a proud member of, of MySpace. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So cheap plug aside, oh, you can go to GameRageMagazine.com to hear all this or to have all this shit in one general central location if you're lazy. So you can just go there and listen to it through our website, and you could laugh at our website because it's terrible. I know. Yeah. Listen, listen, listen. We're not web designers. All right, Get, cut us some fucking slack, okay? We're website, we're website murderers. <laughs> oh, that's true. We're like website serial killers, actually. Yeah, it looks like a homicide on the fucking... <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Anyways, so... Whoops. Get, getting into our, our topic today, you know, uh, the price of your vote. Now, this, this is going to be sort of... This episode will be sort of about, you know, just talking about our democracy in general and the way our democracy is set up because there's... In case a lot of people don't know, there's multiple types of democracies, but the two that we're probably going to mainly focus on is the direct democracy and the representative democracy, which is what we have here in the United States. Aren't we a republic, though? Yeah, we're a constitutional republic with a representative democracy. Yes. So um, now I I, I just I was wondering because I, I really was trying to figure out. And, and wonder what the actual price of your vote would be like, what the, what's the cost of your vote? Like, how much does it actually cost? To, to to vote, to buy a vote, basically. And I did the math. And now, granted, I don't have any figures from past elections other than this this one that was four years ago in 2020. But, you know, I just took the number of, of actual voters as provided by the census. And I, you know, took the total campaign contributions, which, man, I am I was very surprised at the numbers. Uh, the, the Biden campaign spent or fundraised and spent about a billion dollars. And the Trump campaign only spent and raised about seven hundred million dollars, which was kind of I thought, man, that's like a pretty that's like a pretty that's like three hundred and something million. It was like one point eight five billion was the total because I think uh, 
the Biden campaign was a little over a billion dollars. It was like one point some, something billion dollars, man. I was like, damn, that's a pretty that like four hundred million dollars is a big difference in spending, which I, I just thought that was interesting to say. And also he won the election, right? So maybe it does come down to who spends the most fucking money. It is kind of offensive to see that much money go to waste when you could probably do an entire campaign on social media without having going without having to go anywhere. Yeah. And really having to spend minimal. I mean, you could probably do it for a couple thousand bucks. Like, you know, will you win? Don't know about that because you still need to make the uh, face to face interactions across different states. And I don't think. Doing an entirely shit, man, it'd be the world's greatest experiment to find out if you could become president, if you just reside in your home and do a whole you do town hall media, you do everything through social media. I think that'd be a really cool thing to find out if that's even possible. But knowing how boomer our population is, it's probably going to be a struggle to even fucking get people on Facebook or Instagram, <laughs> let alone know what to do with it. So perhaps television and and television appearances in person appearances is the way to go for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Well, I do think when our generation, this millennial generation gets into the boomer aged bracket that they're at now in that, like, I don't know, 55 to 60 or 70 age bracket, sure. I think it's going to have to change. Like It's, it's going to change to probably what you're talking about, where it's, it's, it's going to be all through social media. Everything's going to be that way because that's what we're, you know, essentially used to, and we, we know how to operate it now. Granted, I don't know what insane social medias are going to exist fucking, you know, 35 years from now, but who knows? So, but anyways, getting into the actual cost of your vote. So I just, I did the math and basically each vote costs $11 and 64 cents is what the price of every single vote is. When you look at how much money they spent in trying to get your votes that they basically spent $11 and 64 cents on each voter that they got to vote for them. Does that mean that it's $5 for each of them or each of them? No, spent it's about $11. It's, it's every single. So the, cause I combined the total number. It's every person that voted. So every person that voted in the election, there was a, a definitive number for that. And I, and I took the number that they spent between the two campaigns. And so each vote that they received, Basically, or that they were going each vote that was cast in this election cost eleven dollars and sixty four cents, essentially. So because you took the total number of votes plus yeah. the total number because the other campaigns had like minimal spending. I mean, yeah. it, it was negligible. So essentially, every vote that was cast cost eleven dollars and sixty four cents of their campaigns. Why, why not do it just based on the money that they generated for their campaign individually as a, instead of combined? Well, I did it that way because I thought <clears throat> that the actual total number of v money raised is like that's the pool because the votes are all like in a pool, right? Yeah. So you if you take the money that and you combine it as a as a pool, then you can see how much the entire presidential election cost essentially to get each vote that was that was cast for president. Is if you break it down that way in total. Sure, you could break it down to obviously the numbers will be different because if you did it for a, the billion whatever that Biden got divided by the number of votes he got, the prices are going to change. But overall, that was just the general price of how much they spent per person who actually vote in total, because obviously they're trying to attract every single voter. Right. That's kind of the goal. You want to get as many as you can. So you're obviously trying to attract people on both sides. So you're spending that money in totality to get every single first person to potentially vote for you. So that was just why I did it that way just to, you know, have kind of a baseline number. But, um, I, I just thought that was kind of interesting because it's almost like, Oh man, like if you took that money and said, Hey, I'll give you, I'll give you $11 and 64 cents. If you vote for me, maybe, maybe that would, maybe that would have been the key to get people to vote. If you pay them money, because that's basically what you're doing. You're just paying them not directly, though. You're paying them by trying to convince them to vote for you through ads or whatever, right? Now, granted, all, not all that money is getting spent on that. But um, like I said, I just found it interesting. So anyways, going back to the 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 part about the whole the de democratic system, right? It just it kind of it almost bastardizes the the system itself just because of the 
egregious amount of money that was that they spend every presidential election cycle every four years, basically, to try to get people to vote for them. Like it's over. It's obviously over a billion dollars. It's like almost two billion dollars as it was in 2020. I'm sure. Shit. I, I would love to see. And we won't know until after the election's done. But but I mean, I'd love to see what it's going to be this go around here in 2024 to see how much money they spent on all this bullshit. When if we just if we just eliminated that shit altogether. And just went back to, well, I mean, not even going back to, but setting up a system where this was more of instead of it being a representative type democracy, this was a more of a direct democracy type situation. It would eliminate the need for all this shit. And I was doing some research because I was just curious to see if there are any actual examples of direct democracy currently, which for those that don't know, direct democracy as opposed to representat- representational democracy or representative democracy is, yes, in a direct democracy, everyone gets one vote, everyone votes, and that's it. You vote on the issues, you vote on the laws that get made, you vote on shit, you vote for everything, right? You don't have any middleman. There's no Congress. There's no quote-unquote parliament. There's no one that is going to essentially be making the decisions of what becomes law and what becomes, you know, budgets and things like that. Whereas in the direct democracy, everybody votes for that. Everybody gets a choice. Everybody gets a vote. Right. And so in the representative democracy, it's basically the same with the exception of you're voting for the guy who's going to cast your vote basically. And we, we vote for our representatives in Congress and in the house of representatives and in the Senate. And they basically, you got something to say, or are you just adjusting your thing? Oh, uh, and they basically take and they cast votes on deciding whether or not laws are going to become laws or what the laws are even going to say. Hell, they they introduce laws. They do all this stuff. Now, sure, it it takes a little bit of the responsibility of, of a lot of this out of our hands because it's just like, hey, we voted for this guy and we expect him to vote, you know, kind of how we how we want right or how the majority of the people who voted for this guy or this lady want right that's kind of what they're supposed to use (coughs) to guide them in how to vote if they want to stay in office well if they vote for stuff that the people that put you there don't want then it's not likely you're going to get reelected you'll probably get ousted for someone else who promises them that they're going to vote based on what the majority of them want so it's it's i i don't i don't know if that Back in the day when we were founding, when the, when the founding fathers, and I know I said shit on the last episode about, you know, I, I, I hate all of this deference and this godlike treatment of them because they weren't perfect. And this was something that they did, that they struggled with when, when deciding how our system was going to be set up was, okay, is this going to be some something something else other than just direct democracy? Because again, we just got out of being under a monarchy, so... How are we going to make this work here where people get to decide what happens to them as opposed to letting someone else decide what happens to them? So they basically all agreed that they were going to have a system where someone else just decided you get to vote for the guy who's deciding what happens to you. But you, the decision is taken out of your hands and it's essentially kind of I, like i said i feel like it's a bast like this representative democracy is kind of a bastardization of democracy now one of the things that that a lot of them said back then was oh this would be saving the individual from the tyranny of the people right because all oh, or the tyranny of the majority which I, you can kind of see that argument a little bit but in my estimation isn't that kind of what this whole thing is supposed to be our representative democracy is supposed to be well it's majority rules. It's the majority of the votes make things happen. So the tyranny of of the majority exists within our current system. It exists, but it's not in our own hands. It's not it, it's not up to the people to decide that what the tyranny of the majority is. It's up to the people who are the professional politicians to decide what the tyranny of their majority is going to be, because they are the ones that actually cast the votes to make the laws right so if the tyranny of i I think there's 535 people in total between the house of representatives and the u.s senate 
that are our legislative body federally. So it's up to 535 people to essentially determine the fate of laws that are going to affect the 350 million of us that are here in the United States. Now, I don't know the math off the top of my head because I didn't do it, but that's a infinitely small percentage of the population that's essentially governing and deciding what happens to the rest of us. And I just think that it's more effective in terms of having people decide their own or having at least a direct say and kind of going back to the cost of your vote, right? Like right now in, in 2024, we can roughly say it's, it's probably similar. It's probably a little more than that $11 and 64 cents that it was fucking four years ago. Right. We probably say it's a little more expensive than that with inflation and whatever they're going to spend. But in the, in the United States here, it's, it's been like 60 years since we've had where that vote, if you were 18 years old or older and, and you were allowed to vote, that vote, the cost of that vote could be your life because at, at that, at those times, we, that was the last draft we had, right? That was the last military draft that was instituted. And if you voted a certain way, not realizing the potential consequences of someone else getting to decide if you have to potentially get drafted and go to war and die, well, the cost of your vote was your life. It costs you your life because you because you voted poorly or you chose wrong, right? Um, and and going back to that kind of draft situation, if we had a system where we were directly responsible for making and deciding what happens and who declares war on what and how that shit works, if every person had their own vote to do that with, I think that obviously not every country would subscribe to that, but I think here, at least in the United States, we would probably have a lot been involved in a lot less fucking wars throughout our history. If that was determined, because let's be honest. Yes. The majority of the people that vote are the, are the boomers. It's uh, no matter what generation you're in, it's always the old folk. It's always the ones that are, you know, in their fifties and, and older. Those are the majority of probably people who actually consistently go out and vote for things. The young crowd is unreliable. The young crowd is very, what's the word fickle when it comes to utilizing our actual ability to determine our fates and vote. So, I think it was in 2008. That was probably that was when it was it was Obama versus uh, I don't fuck Kerry. I think that was the first right. Is that who it was you talking about for the presidential? Election? Yeah, in the presidential election was it, who was to, who did it, he go? It was, oh, it was Obama McCain? And McCain. That's right. It was that was that was the second go around right in 2012. Was it was Kerry? 12 was Mitt Romney remember. and oh and Romney. Obama. God damn it! I get those assholes confused all the time. They look the same, man. Mitt Romney and fucking John Kerry look look the same, no, man. John McCain, motherfucker. No, no, I'm saying that Mitt Romney. And John, or uh, what's his name? I know they're on the Democrat side. Uh, yeah, John Kerry, Mitt Romney. John yeah, Kerry, kind of, but yes, yeah. they look the same to me. So I, I, just, I just get the confused for some reason. I don't know why. No, Mitt Romney's a Republican. But anyways, so it was John McCain versus Obama. That was like the highest turnout of an election that we've ever had. And that was because there was, again, it was a historic election because there was a, a possibility that we could have the first black president, right? That was the reason that the young crowd showed up and voted was because they wanted to be a part of history. Hey, they did it. The election before that, minimal turnout for that age bracket, those younger age brackets. And the one after, also a lower turnout because the history had already been made. There was no incentive for people to get involved. And that's kind of the problem with the representative democracy is yes, we need we do probably need someone to kind of make decisions in, in the moment for yes, the collective defense. We need we need shit like that, right? So we probably need a president or some sort of figurehead to to handle these things. But in a direct democracy, your vote for that person is is that's it. You vote for that. Whoever gets the most votes, that's who wins. That's the end of it. There's no Electoral, like we have this electoral college, which 
that shit is just fucking kind of it's it's again it's a further kink in taking the power out of our hands because one of the things a lot of people don't know about the whole electoral college system is all we're doing by voting is is putting our votes into a pool for a candidate like here in California we they go into a pool and then whichever candidate we voted for however many whoever gets the most votes in the state ends up getting all of the electoral college voters which are people that are appointed to vote in this electoral college and they're supposed to go and cast their vote for who the people that were in their sector you know voted for right but what's funny is they don't actually have to do that they can they can decide to cast their vote for somewhere else now there have been very few times throughout history that has actually happened but the mechanism exists where you could do that if if so it needed to be done so if you you don't need to even rig an election let's per se because as long as you can convince the people who are going to be the electoral college voters to vote however you want you just got to get enough of them on on board and you get enough of the electoral college votes and then that's a wrap you you just won the election you don't need to rig nothing you don't need to you need to do anything so it, it's it's a further, like I said, a kink in the in the wheel of the will of the people, right? Because that's what democracy. It's everybody always fucking touts this thing about, oh, we're we're a democracy. It's the will of the people and all this stuff. But again, in reality, there's so many roadblocks in the way for that will to be enacted, and there's so many different cogs that have to be turned in order for the quote unquote will of the people to happen. That by the time your vote into turning into the end result of a law being made or something to that effect, your vote is so far removed from that. And there are so many fucking things that were in the way that you're not actually really voting on anything other than you're just voting on people. Now there are some sectors of the U S and mainly it's in the East coast at the local level where they have their little townships and things like that. A lot of those cities, that's one of the relics, I guess of the, revolutionary era is that they all practice direct democracy. So in a lot of those um, local elections, they do just vote on the issues straight up. There's no, you know, we kind of have that here a little bit with our, uh, like, you know, the props that they do on the, on the ballot, like the prop, whatever about whatever, right? If someone gets enough signatures, they can have a prop, a proposition put onto the ballot and then we get to vote on it. And that's a, that's a form of direct democracy because we are voting on a specific law and turning it into an enforceable act by the state. If we vote in favor of it or if we vote against it and we say, no, we don't want that. But there's not that many props that get to come up of all the laws that get made in the States or at least here in California, there are a, Again, an infinitely small percentage that actually get turned into these propositions that we directly get to decide what happens. And it's further left up to our state representatives to to decide what they want to do for them to get together and decide. And this is where we get into the the corruption aspect that has been bred into our system. It may be at the beginning it didn't start this way, but this type of system kind of it's it almost was meant to happen it's almost a guarantee that if you end up in this representative democracy system eventually over time you will have a level of corruption that you can no longer get rid of you just can't oust it it's just too ingrained in the system and that's kind of how we get to this point where we're at today where now it's too late like we can't undo it it can't be undone Because the people that would decide that, they are the ones who get to decide if to undo it or not. Not directly to us, the people. We don't get to decide on anything. We're just picking the people who get to go into the spot to make the decision. And that, to me, is probably the biggest flaw of our current system that we have. And I don't think a lot of people like talking about that. And it really fucking bothers me because it's both sides of the aisle. It's both the left, the the mainstream left and the mainstream right. Neither of them want to say anything negative or criticize the mechanism of the state because they don't want to risk 
being silenced by it because that's what ends up happening. If you choose to state an opinion or to discuss things and you're not allowed to talk about them for fear of reprisal, well, that stifles which it stifles ideas. It stifles speech. It stifles the the potential to say, Hey, maybe this isn't working anymore. And we need to come up with something else. We need to, we need to, we need to, we need to rehaul overhaul this. Right. And so in talking about the direct democracy, yes, there are some issues with it. I, I it's not perfect. And I'm not, you know, I think we're pretty clear. I should have probably said this at the beginning of the episode, but we're pretty clear on all the podcasts that we talk about. I mean, mainly it's CUP is the one that's we're idiots, right? Like we're, we're just dummies and we're just talking about shit that, you know, well, shit, this, this podcast specifically is shit that I enjoy, but we're just talking about stuff and, and I'm pretty good at doing some Wikipedia research and, you know, fact checking some things. And yeah, I'm not a hundred percent by the book or a hundred percent accurate on everything. Cause it's impossible. You can't be, but I'm at least willing to admit that, yeah, I'm an idiot and I don't have all the answers, but I don't think we need someone to come in and say, oh, hey, here's what the answer is. We just need someone to come in and say, hey, maybe there's a better way of doing this. I don't know what it is, but maybe we should start talking about a different and better way to do this. And so that's a disclaimer. I guess it's probably it's probably halfway. Through. It's too late in the episode to fucking give that. But whatever. It's been given. So that was one of the things I was going to talk about with the representative, I'm sorry, the direct democracy is the issues. They call it the trilemma because it's three issues. It's it's participation, deliberation, and equality. And so one of the things that gets talked about is the participation aspect. And because it's pretty evident in our own current representative democracy that there's not a lot of part, there's not a shit ton of participation. It's It's less than 50%, I would say on average of people that vote in, let's just call it, let's just say the presidential election, right? So one of the problems, if you have every, every law you have, it's, it's hinged on people voting yay or nay, right? Well, if you only have 40% of the population consistently voting, well then only 21% of that population needs to vote in favor of something, or I'm sorry, 50% of the 51% of that population of 40%. So that's basically the numbers don't lie. But like uh, you, you technically could have a per, potentially 21% of the country deciding, you know, what's going to happen. So participation is an issue. Well, to me, the logical solution would be, well, if we, if we don't have a draft, we get rid of the draft, then, well, hey, guess what? The participation is instead of being drafted and potentially being sent to war, it's required that you vote. Make it illegal to not vote. If you didn't fucking turn in your vote, Hey, they fucking send some shit to you. So, hey, you need to do this again and vote. And okay, cool. Yeah, I get it. Problems could happen. But hey, then they call you to fucking whatever, whatever system you want to use and say, hey, you come before us and we say you didn't vote here. Here's your paper. You do it right now. And if you tell them to fuck off, you don't want to do it. Hey, whatever. Then you get the punishment. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's going to jail. Maybe it's ah, fuck. Who knows? All right. But I think that's an easy way to eliminate that problem of of participation. And then you get into the next part about it which is the deliberation part which is about people actually discussing what the benefits and the consequences are of these of these laws that you're voting on now here in california i don't know how they do it in every other state but i mean i assume it's probably similar but here in california at least when we have the, the propositions that that come up on our ballots every you know year there's a couple of them at least there's there's two sections you get this whole pamphlet you get this whole booklet and i don't know how many people actually read the booklet but I read the booklet because, A, it, it's, it's, too, it's too muddy to try and get a clear picture of, of both sides of the issue if you try to watch it on TV or you try to listen to it on the radio or you hear them talking about it. It's too muddy because each side that's, that's promoting it and whatever platform they're promote, promoting it on is generally it's, – it's generally skewed to one side. So – you're not really getting the full picture. So I at least like to hear both sides of the, sto- of the story. And one of the examples that I'll use is the uh, the sports betting, the the sports betting proposition that came up. I, I think it was a couple years ago in California where they wanted to essentially make it so that you could do sports betting outside of Indian or outside of the Native American casino areas like that sports betting would be allowed 
in other places that weren't those things. Now, obviously, the main proponent against that was the indie was the Native American casinos themselves because they essentially, well, they don't want to lose money because if 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 it's they have a monopoly on sports betting because that's the only place you can do it at is is it a, is it a any casino and then they also i think they wanted to deregulate or not deregulate but they wanted to do something with uh with exploring allowing other places in california that weren't native american c- casinos to do gambling i think that's where they thought it was going to lead so it's like hey if you could just go gamble or do whatever you want anywhere else well then why would you go to the, to, to the casino why would you go to the res and and do it there right you could just do it somewhere else so that's going to hurt them. So obviously they have a vested interest in making sure that, oh, you hear all the bad sides about sports betting and you hear all the bad sides about gambling. And it's hilarious and hypocritical because obviously they're the ones doing that, right? They're the ones that are doing this gambling, but they're saying about how addictive gambling is. And well, wait a minute, how are you allowed to do it then? Right? So you read, you read both sides of the story and you yourself get to determine what you want to do. And I think that the deliberation portion of it can be handled in a way that gives both sides the same amount of time to be heard. And that's where we get into the next part about it, which is the equality part, which is about having equal time given or equal discussion regarding both opinions of whether the law should be changed. Yes, the law should be changed. No. Right. <clears throat> so if we set aside time on whatever the, I don't know, public access, television, radio, whatever, send people pamphlets that have both sides of the information. <clears throat> yeah, it's up to them to read it. And listen, I'm not saying again, this is perfect because I know some people are just going to skim the shit. Some people are probably just going to throw it in the trash as they do. I'm sure they do now. There's <clears throat> people that I know that vote. Now, and and they don't read, they just read it when they get the ballot and they say, do you want to allow this? And what's fucked is, is most of the time they're the, these, these things are worded in such a way that you don't really actually know what you're voting for, because it's worded in a way where if you're voting, yes, you're against it. If you're voting, no, you're in favor of it. So that's counterintuitive to what most people think right they think oh if you want to vote to allow let's use the the gay marriage one for an example right because that was one here in california the the prop eight i think it was that question was worded in a way where if you wanted to support gay marriage you had to answer no and if you wanted to ban gay marriage you had to write yes but it but the question or the the voting question was worded in such a way where a lot of people were very confused as to what their vote actually meant. They, they, they voted yes, thinking that they were actually supporting gay marriage when in fact they were not, they were vote they voted against it. So I think clear wording and clear statements about what the question is needs to happen. And, and what's crazy is the, the people who lobby and do these things that, that lobby the people who make the questions, they are the ones that get to decide how it reads. And so there's another level or another another aspect of what we were talking about before in the the corruption aspect where the outcomes of things can be changed because there's too many people in the way of our vote actually turning into a law or turning into legislation is it's it's there's too many fucking people there's too many middlemen and I think that we need to get away from that I think that's one of the things we need to do is we need to unload the what is that what is that phrase trim the fat or cut the chaff from the wheat or whatever it is right our systems it's become too blo- our democracy itself has become too bloated there's too many too many fucking cooks in the kitchen and if we can cut most of that shit out and go back to a direct well i even go back to because we never were a direct straight up democracy as a country but if we can maintain a constitutional republic but have it be more of a representative or i'm sorry have it be more of a direct democracy i think that could do that could solve some of our problems or could at least help now again i don't know how we get there 
I don't because, like I said, it's it's too the system is too it's too polluted in and of itself. Where they're the people that make the decisions on that are never going to vote to do that to to get rid of their 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 system because they have it too good. Our our congressmen men and women make way too much money. They all make more than myself and everyone listening to this podcast more than likely from their salaries of just being senators and and uh representatives right they they make more just in that alone not to mention all the insider knowledge that they get to receive as as being the ones who decide how legislation comes about and hey if a company wants something to not affect them or to be worded in a way where they can be unharmed by a new law that comes out hey well we'll slide you a little bit of money or we'll slide you some info or we'll slide you something on the on the low so that way you can vote in our favor or hell even knowing what the outcome's going to be having the insider information of knowing what the outcome of a vote is going to be because you are in the know as to how everyone's going to vote and then making money off of that that's a that's a deeply flawed part of our representative democracy that is not going to ever change unless the system is just reset and everyone's removed. And unfortunately, like I said, there's no way for that to happen because they're not going to vote for it. Congressman, there's, I, there was a thing that I read that the congressman had, Congress has never voted to not give itself a raise. Because they vote on the budgets and stuff, and they vote to give themselves raises. Or not. There's not been a single time in history that they have voted to not give themselves a raise. Which pretty much tells you all you need to know. That their interests, the, the people that represent us in this democracy do not have our interests of us, the people, as their number one priority. Which they should. They theoretically should. But unfortunately... From theory to application slash practice, things change. And I know I'm talking about direct democracy and theory. And yeah, listen, there are plenty of examples of direct democracy that has that basically every direct democracy that's existed throughout history eventually turns into some sort of dictatorship. Um, so there's a flaw there as well. But I would like to think that we as humans and those of us who at least have looked at history and studied history could potentially learn from the mistakes of the past. Just like we learned from the mistakes of the past when the when our representative democracy was founded. They said, shit, we don't want any more kings. We don't need to be told what to do by some asshole that was just born into it. Cool, let's give us some beneficial rights that can't be taken away. And let's go from there and see what we're going to do. And, you know, over the last couple hundred years, it's worked out pretty up. <laughs> it's worked out pretty all right for us. You know, it's worked out OK. But. Now we're at this crossroads. And I think to tie it back into the, the current events that this upcoming election is really this is a make or break for our democracy, I feel like. I feel like it's this is make or break. And I, I'm not trying to be alarmist or I'm not trying to be inflammatory well i guess not intentionally inflammatory but i think that because tensions are so high and people feel like they're not act like they're not actually represented i don't feel like i'm actually represented like i feel like my vote doesn't matter and i feel like there's a lot of people that also agree with that and the sad part is 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 we're all right our vote kind of doesn't really matter anymore this is this has turned into a dog and pony show our democracy has turned into a, basically a game show or a reality television series it's scripted from the beginning and the outcomes are likely predetermined or can be determined in a way that we didn't get to pick what happens hell i think American Idol might actually be more of a direct democracy or more of a democracy in theory than than what our current governmental representative system has. Because at least when you vote on American Idol, your vote's counting towards whoever you're voting it towards. And 
that affects how now granted do those assholes change the change the fucking uh votes and do they sure i'm sure they do i'm sure it happens sure it's all rigged but in theory it should it's not so from theory to application yes there's problems there's issues and who knows what the solutions are but i do think that it's important as part of our constitutional republic and our our current representative democracy that we at least allow the discourse to look at these these things and at least try to maybe analyze them and maybe figure out if there's something different we could do if there's a better way about doing this and when we get these things like speech and and things stifled by people who are supposed to be representing us because again I'm not trying to be intentionally inflammatory but you know when we talk, we talked about that whole thing I think it was on the Central Unintelligence podcast about the anti-semitism awareness act and how it it stifles speech right well well that that was not a law or anything that was that was brought up by any one of us any one regular citizen no it was it was brought up into congress By the people that we voted to be in there, our representatives, they brought it up. They thought this was a good idea. They thought it's a great idea to be able to tell somebody that you can't say something and it can be interpreted in such a broad way that, well, if we just don't like what you're kind of what what you're what you're pointing at or alluding to, we can just say that this is no, no good. You can't do it. Ousted punishments for these things that you are saying. And and that inherently, by default and by definition, reduces our ability to bring ideas and to bring discussion amongst each other in public forums for us to talk about these things that are potentially uncomfortable. And, you know, I think that overwhelmingly in history, if if people are allowed to at least talk, yes, there are examples where Talking uh, went the went, went bad. It, allowing people to have radical ideas went the wrong way, right? But I think, in the majority wise, it it's gone good. It's gone well, and I think we should continue to allow it and not stifle discussion, because that's how we get to where we are now, where we are entering, you know, our 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 democracy is entering that 1984 esque sort of format now. And yeah, digital surveillance and all that stuff has really hampered it. The Patriot Act, all these other things that we've kind of talked about on other things have have contributed to this essentially surveillance state, for lack of a better word. But if our representatives would have truly been looking out for what's the best for us, things would have went differently. Or if we were allowed to vote on it ourselves and not and take out the middleman, I don't think that a lot of these laws, I don't think the Patriot Act would have passed. Even post 9-11, if people had to vote on it, and you can call it whatever you want, but I think enough people would have actually read the thing to say, hey, wait a minute, guys. We're given some authority here that uh, isn't going to be easily walked back. So we should probably really think about this. And at least it would have opened up the the discourse more instead of 500 and some change people that we voted to be in there deciding that they're going to just go ahead and do this. So I don't have the answers. I don't know what the solutions are, but I'm at least just, you know, presenting ideas. Do you have any thoughts? (laughs) No, I don't care. I do. I was no. just waiting for my turn. Sorry, I was I was fucking. You went for like a thirty fucking minute rant, dude. <laughs> yeah, sorry, plus, forty sorry. minute rant. Sorry. Hey, at least it was somewhat coherent this no, time. No, I mean I'm I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying it wasn't. I'm just saying I was just waiting for my turn. That's oh, all. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I think you get. I think you have way too much faith in people. I I'm fully of the opinion that totalitarianism or authoritarianism is the way to go. Uh, represent representational democracy uh i i i I think i'm actually in favor of it as it is right now is it perfect absolutely not but i also think it's it's like the men in black thing when when agent k was talking to will smith's character i don't remember what letter he is he might be j Uh i forget but he says he tells him people are or he says 
the individual is smart, but people are stupid. They get panicky. They do all these things. And I think having a direct democracy is ludicrous because think about this. You you do a direct democracy and maybe the cities with the biggest populations or the states with the biggest populations end up controlling the country regardless for, for all time because they are the epicenters of the country itself. So things will never actually change because they do not represent the vast perspectives that exist within the United States. So I'm all that's the reason I think the representational democracy is a thing within our own government because we have two senates so everybody has a fair vote for each state, right? Everybody gets two. Nobody's bigger than the other state even though in the House of Representatives we probably have what? Like 50 seats or who the hell knows how many seats California has, but it's to offset the U the US Senate is to offset the big states because it becomes too much. We become too overwhelming to decide what happens to the country when smaller states would largely be lost in the shuffle. And that's why it's hard for me to justify having a direct democracy uh, in theory, I suppose, because mob mentality um how easily we get caught up in ideas and i just don't like i just don't trust people so that and and those are very good points those are very those are those are great points to, to bring up and which really this is why i'm in favor of just total anarchy I, there should be no government there should be nothing that's the best way to do it fucking everybody does whatever the hell they want no one tells anybody what to do and if i don't like you if you want to come to me and tell me what to do well i can kill you all right that's that's the rules do whatever the fuck you want um if i don't like something you did to me oh that's cool i'll i'll just do what i want to you then bottom line sure maybe that's a survival of the fittest maybe that's only the strong survive who who knows but and and that'll probably lead to even more problems but th- at the end of the day that, that's probably really what I truly think is should, we should just be in a complete state of anarchy. But I'll say this. You talk about the the houses and yes, it, it, the House of Representatives is is done. The number of representatives are based on population of the states. And then in the Senate, it's everybody gets two no matter what, big or small. Right. So that there's a check and a balance there yeah. for because if if one if if 10 states got together, they could maybe outvote everybody, let's say. Right. But then when it has to pass in the Senate, well, now that's out the window. You got to get 51 percent of the states to, to say yes to this. So, cool. That makes sense. Right. But then when we come to our election for the chief executive of the country, the president, it's all based on population. You really only need to win like a third of the states to be able to get elect to get enough electoral college votes. Maybe it's like, I don't know, a quarter. No, not a quarter, but maybe it's a little more than a third. But you could theoretically just figure out how to win California, Texas, New York, and Florida, maybe. And then I think there's maybe like Ohio for some reason. And if you could get like those five or six to to seven or eight states, you could get all of the fucking you'd win almost. So it 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 it's it's like a hypocritical system within within itself because when we vote for the president. It should be like everybody get every state gets two votes, right? So everybody's vote, if you want to do this electoral college, everything's equal. Everything's on equal footing and equal terms. But instead, it's not. And this is how the system gets gamed is because they figure out, oh, if I could just win these certain states. And that's what's crazy is realistically the swing states are what determines the winner of the election. Because all the red states are going to vote red and all the blue states are going to vote, blow, vote, blah, 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 vote blue, right? It's never going to change. But if you get... Shit. All you got to do is figure out how to win two to five purple states and you just won. You won the whole thing. Which is crazy because it's really comes down to those five states that are the, the purple states or however many there are that they really do decide because if they want to turn red or turn blue, they, they will decide the outcome of the election, basically, because, again, the, the major population states. They're going to vote the same. They're going to vote red every time they're going to vote blue every time, you know, basically. So. It's crazy how there's this dichotomy within our own system that, yes, when we make laws and stuff, we have this set up so that it's kind of based on population one house and then it's based on equal footing, which is insane to me that when we vote for president, 
you could lose the popular vote, but you you could you could have forty nine percent of the people vote for you, but you could you could still become president off of that, which is insane if you think about it. Game in the system, I guess, right? That's why they that's why they have people that literally get paid millions of dollars to just do campaign shit and figure out, okay, how can we turn this one county in this one state, which will make this then turn red or blue or what have you. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I see <laughs> authoritarianism is the way to go. It's way easier. We should do the hell divers, manage democracy, right? That manage be, democracy. That should be the true measure of how <laughs> we do things because uh, government militaristic author- authoritarianism, authoritarianism where we kill Alien bugs and alien robots is probably the perfect form of government. Because everyone gets to vote and everyone gets to kill the enemy. <laughs> That's, everyone, everyone's focused on killing other things that are not human. And this is why I advocate for an alien invasion for 2024. I really think that that would just solve all of our problems. <laughs> I mean, it would give us this whole host of new problems, but it would solve all of our current problems immediately. It wouldn't matter who you vote for. None of that shit would matter. It wouldn't matter if you're white, black, green, blue. wouldn't matter what God you believe in. All that would matter is that you grab a gun and you start shooting the things that don't look like us. You'd like to think so, but then you know there's going to be people that if they find out that the, the human side is the losing side only based on the seemingly aliens taking over based on technology or if we were hit first... They'd immediately flip. And then as much as we would want to have a united front, I think there would be a heavy dose of the population. It'd be like, no, I'm going to go with the alien side um, and, and try to kiss ass on the other end to stay alive or to self-preserve. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't think I don't think a united front is is a is, I don't think it's going to exist when that time comes, because there's going to be people that think. Uh, now, if I want to live, I want to be on the winning side. And if it looks like we're losing <laughs> aliens, easy to take the alien side. Alien aliens. Side. Well, that's why we we uh, managerial democratically throw them into the fucking pits of hell <laughs> and then and then move on without them. But anyways, <clears throat> I will say that. At bare minimum. I think that. People need to at least be a little more open. And I think people are open to to trying to maybe not figure out. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I don't think we need to figure out a whole new governance system that has never existed before. But hell, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we do need to do that. Maybe we need to incorporate some fucking system that uses the Internet or something to that effect or uses the technology that we have today. Some some form of governance that. Now, granted, they'll just be like China and was we'll just, we'll just be a surveillance state at that point. But maybe there is a way that we can leverage the technology and the things that we have that exist in our society that make life easy for us. Maybe we can leverage those things to create a new system of governance that is the most decent and the most all rightist. I don't know if that's possible, but hell, I'm willing to at least talk about it and at least try. And with the people that I know that feel like disillusioned with our current system, I'm not the, I know I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one who is not happy with the way the system has, has turned out. And we're silenced people like me or people that have the opinion of we need to change the system but I don't think it should be changed to benefit the right or to benefit the left. I think we should obliterate both of those things. We are silenced because the people that are in favor of change, they get their word out there and it gets promoted because if it's, it's beneficial to one side or the other, which to me is not advocating for real change. It's just further deepening the current system that we live in. And there's a lot of fucking assholes on the internet that love to do that, that love to just, they just get so many followers because they become even more divisive for the side that they're on, for the the right side or the left side of their democracy that they see, right? They, they get all these assholes to listen and they get them incensed and enraged to say, 
oh, look at what they're doing over there. And oh, we need to do it this way. And but it needs to be it needs to be the right way. And it needs to be the right way that benefits our opinion or our kind or our side or whatever. Issue that they're advocating for. That's what people that's the people that get highlighted that want to call for change. And like I said, that ain't real change. That's that's horseshit. That's that's just that's just fucking straight up charlatanism. Maybe maybe they they don't even give a shit. Maybe they just do it because there's money. Yeah, I've seen people that support certain figures in in some type of uh, some political figures. I'm not gonna say which one, but I actually don't know if that's what they want to to vote for. But they pitch up their canopies and they they shell they sell. They sell and they shill <laughs> this candidate. And I'm thinking, do they really care or is it really just about the money? Because this is even licensed directly by the person that is the political figure or they just printing out their own shit. And that's all they want. So I don't know. I don't even think the people that you're, you're talking about, in my opinion, I don't really know if they give a shit. They they state an opinion and they're like, all right, I got something going here. I'm getting eight million followers. They kind of like what I'm saying. Let's see how inflammatory I get before they actually start doling out money. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's one of the things that I like about doing this is that like this podcast will never have a sponsor. I'm sure if we get to a certain number of downloads, there's going to be people that want us to shill their opinions and shill their, you know, promote their side because this is obviously a political podcast. So I'm sure that, Oh, once it gets big enough, people on the right are going to want to pay to have their side highlighted and people on the left are going to, cause I know there's a lot of podcasts that do that, that are left leaning or right leaning or what have you. And they get money from those sides to state the opinions and to further push them. This podcast will never have a sponsor. It's never going to have someone, no matter how big it gets, we're never going to take anyone's money for this podcast because it needs to remain independent. It needs to remain untainted where these are at least just our opinions and anyone else that we may potentially have on to discuss the opinions. It's not being paid for. It's not being it's not being sullied, I guess. Right. For lack of a better word. The only thing you'll hear getting shielded on here is our own stuff <laughs> for, for, you know, really. Right. Until Raytheon gives us a $10 million check. Listen, <laughs> I never said anything about Raytheon. All right. But goddamn, hey, if Raytheon fucking cut me a check right now, uh, I'll fuck whatever you want me to say. Whatever you want me to say. Good buddy. Establishment. Establishment. You know what's right for me. <laughs> <laughs> this this will change. This pro this program will go from being called no party preference to being called Raytheon. Why it needs to be in your life more. Like that <laughs> for 10 million dollars, sure. Nuke the whales. Yep, absolutely. For 10 million bucks. And, you know, listen, that's part of the podcast too is, you know, the levity of being able to make those jokes and say those things. Really, the Central Unintelligence podcast would probably be the one that would get approached by Raytheon first. I feel like <laughs> industrial complex. I am for thee. Yeah, military industrial complex for me and for thee for everyone is what. That, that, yeah, that's that's yeah. What, whatever we got to say on those other ones, but this podcast no dice. All right, ain't no ain't no ain't no one other than Game Rage going to be saying shit on here. You'll see. We'll see. We'll see. No, I'm see serious. Yeah, we'll I'm see. serious. I'm we're saying that now. I'm saying that now. Because don't listen, I'm willing to sell out all the other podcasts. All right. They can be (laughs) they can be fucking sourced and sponsored by anyone. But this one, I think, should just be its own. And there should be no ads on it. No, nothing, because it's just about political discourse and it's about having the conversation. And I don't think it should be swayed by anything. And, And I'll say this. If some of the things that I or you or, you know, Frank, when he comes on here, if anything we say on here loses us sponsorships on other podcasts. Okay, that's fine. I don't give a fuck. This is the one that we can talk about the controversial shit and say what we think, and no one no one will tell us we can't say it. And if they don't want to give us their money, that's fine. Some other people will definitely shut up and give us their money for sure, though, for other things. So, anyways. Um, damn. All right, cool, man. I didn't know if that was even going to go an hour, but shit. It went an hour, and it was, I think, fairly coherent. So, shit. Good stuff. And obviously, this is the first 
Sorry, were you going to say something? I don't want to. No. Okay. I, this is the first batch of five episodes that we're doing, right? This one's only, this one's number two. And this is like, I don't know, this is kind of a newer format because, I mean, there really isn't a format, but it's like the what we're talking about is kind of new in the way that we're exploring how to talk about these things. So, yeah, sometimes it's going to maybe sound convoluted or maybe it's going to sound a little, I don't know, dis- discombobulated, but obviously over time, just like with all of our other podcasts, that's going to get better. Don't explain it to them. Don't even apologize because they don't even know the difference. No offense. <laughs> Fuck you also. Uh, what I mean by that is that you don't have to explain shit, dude. You 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 already just stated what the purpose of the podcast is, so fucking let it be. No, you don't have to explain. You know, that's a very good point, and I think you're right. Authoritarianism. <laughs> Author- no, dude, authoritarian Adam. That's your- <laughs> double A authoritarianism. And first, Adam. And just I know I hope you know I'm joking that I'm not actually for authoritarianism. Unless you're down for that, and I'm I'm the captain of the ship, then otherwise, <laughs> no. But I, I am joking. I just want you to know that I don't actually. That's that's no way to go in life. So I'm fucking around. But please know that I'm joking. I, I'm saying that right now, and that's all hey, you need to. know. You know what? You don't need to explain it to them. They know the purpose of the podcast. Yeah, Fuck you. Yeah. All right. Fuck you, people. All right. Yeah. The 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 no party preference crowd. Fuck you. That's that's the that's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be the shirt. It's gonna be the logo, and then at the bottom it's gonna say "fuck you." Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyways, you got anything else to add? Uh, no. Fuck you and see you next episode. Absolutely. And but before you uh, go, if you just wanted to hear about all of our other stuff again, you know, you can go to GameRageMagazine.com and check out all other podcasts and you can hear uh, Millennial Frog's new albums, Poverty of Content, which is the intro and outro songs of this uh, podcast are from. The intro is by my dropshipping manual off of Poverty of Content. And the uh, outro is called Literally Just Eating on Poverty of Content. So you can check those out now everywhere. Uh, Apple, Music, Spotify, you know, all the good places where people stream music and whatnot. It hit triple aluminum. Oh, dude. Yeah, it, it's 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 on track. I think it's actually on track to go sage, <laughs> which isn't even a metal. But that's, you know, <laughs> that's that's how good it is. All right. Anyways. All right. Well, thanks for listening. And shit. We'll catch you on the next one.